<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this um, special meeting of the Conservative European Forum, where um, we will be hearing from Lord Tugendhat, and uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for conversation and questions about um, his his views on the relationship between our party and uh, Europe, and uh, in particular on his excellent book, The Worm in the Apple, which is a um, an account of the Conservative Party's relationship with Europe and with the EU membership question, going right back from the, the times uh, when the UK was first applying through to the aftermath of the referendum. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a polemic, I think it's fair to say, it's, it's a measured uh, nuanced account that I think tries to be fair in, in giving an account of why people thought, acted and voted as they did, whether um, Christopher himself agrees with some, some individuals or, or, or groups or not. Um, the, I want to uh, just note we've had apologies from a large number of our members who are out knocking on doors or delivering leaflets for the local election campaigns. And I know there's a number of members of the House of Lords who would hope to be here uh, are um, voting um, on one or other of the government's bills on which there's quite a bit of ping pong taking place uh, this uh, tonight. Um, can I also um, welcome and thank, I, think that, I don't think Ros Altman is, is able to be here, she's one of those, but I do want to just pay tribute to her for her contribution to CEF's very successful campaign uh, to moderate the Nationalities and Borders Bill, where a number of amendments that we have been quietly promoting um, did, did find favour with the House of Lords, although we, we await to see what the final outcome of the toings and throwings between the Houses are. Um, I am not going to um, read out a great uh, curriculum vitae for Christopher Tugendhat. Um, he will be well known to most people here. Uh, I think in particular, though I just note to be a long-standing a loyal member, an active member of the Conservative Party and the broader Conservative family, that he served in the House of Commons as the Member of Parliament for the cities of London and Westminster, uh, and then was uh, picked to go to Brussels in the days when we had two commissioners as the Conservative uh, Commissioner there, um, and therefore has experience of both Westminster and Brussels and broader European politics. Um, Christopher, I think we, we really, you, you're going to speak for perhaps 10 minutes or yeah. so. Then we will have a brief conversation and then I will open up the floor to any questions or comments that anybody here wishes to make. Afterwards, I remind you this again at the end, there are copies of Christopher's book are on sale on the uh, table in the corner and Lord Tugendhat has very generously agreed to donate five pounds uh, from the price of each book sold to CEF funds, for which um, I and the uh, executive committee are extremely grateful <coughs> to him. So the more copies you buy, uh, the more you will be contributing to CEF funds. But Christopher, thank you very much for giving up time to speak to us today. We we'll look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. Well, David, thank you very much. And I hope colleagues will forgive me if I rush away fairly promptly afterwards. We are on the running three line whip um, in the House of Lords over a period of four days. As I, oh, as I, I um, told the whips that this was a prior engagement, <laughs> and one to which I attach great importance. And if one's written a book and devoted all the time I had, I, I had to doing that, even a three line whip can't keep one away from promoting it. Now, as David said, um, this is not a polemic. My aim has been to write a first draft of history. What I've tried to do is to survey the whole span of, his, of the history of Britain's relationship with the EU through the prism of the Conservative Party from the very beginning, the signature of the Coal and Steel Community Treaty of Paris in 1951 to the 2016 referendum. This, of course, is not the whole story, that the Conservatives were in power for more than two-thirds of the time, and 
pretty nearly all the critical moments. And therefore, by concentrating on the conservative relationship with Europe and the critical <coughs> moments, I think I'm able to show, I hope I'm able to show, how the problems which reached their apotheosis under David Cameron had their roots very far back, right back to Macmillan, right back even to, to Churchill. In fact, the, the most, in my view, one of the most critical aspects of the relationship was our failure to be in at the beginning. And that is a decision taken first by Attlee, but then by Churchill. And if you think about it, the European Union or the European Economic Community or in its various guises is the only major international organization of which Britain has been a member of which we were not influential founder members. We were founder members of, the, of NATO, the UN, the IMF, and even the European Convention on Human Rights. But the EU was the only one that we were not, and therefore it was formed without any input from us. It was for it, the language and the imagery were alien to us, and it it left us feeling uncomfortable, you know, an ill-fitting suit. Whereas in in, in the case of NATO and and uh, the IMF and the UN and all the rest of it, we felt we were dealing with something which we had helped to create. So that was the first big. Error. The second, in terms of time, was a mistake made when we actually joined. And I, I, it, it hurts me rather to say this because I've always been a great fan of Ted Heath. But the, the, the great mistake was the rejection of Lord Kilmuir's advice. Now, as Sir David Maxwell Fife, Lord Kilmuir had been one of the architects of the European Convention on Human Rights, and he was a very enthusiastic supporter of British membership of the common market as it then was. But he presented as Lord Chancellor a cabinet paper in which he set out all the issues about Parliament, the court, sovereignty, the whole bit that has caused so much difficulty over so many years. And he said that those issues had to be laid before the British people and they had to be argued out and that if they weren't laid before the British people and argued out, they would cause a lot of trouble down the track. Well, how right he was. And unfortunately, both Howard Macmillan at the time of entry, uh, at the time of his application, and Ted Heath at the time of entry, obfuscated what we were joining. It was presented as an economic community. It was presented as, uh, as being something which had limitations the broader aspects, the nature of the political commitment was something which was obfuscated. And that, I think, was a great mistake. Then you came, then one comes to Margaret Thatcher and the great row over the British budget. Now, in my opinion, the United Kingdom had a genuine grievance. There was a real problem. We were paying a disproportionate amount. And what the two leading European statesmen Chancellor Schmidt and President Giscard d'Estaing should have done was to take Margaret Thatcher on one side to say there is a problem, we need to sort it out and then get on with the next business. Instead, they put her up against a wall and made her fight. They didn't, in fact, take her very seriously, which was another mistake, but they put her up against the wall and made her fight. And that had two consequences. One consequence was that it impressed on the minds of the British people and the British media the concept that the membership of the EU was a conflictual relationship. It was us against them. It was one long, continuous battle, rather than being membership of a group of, of fluctuating alliances and continuous negotiation. So it had that impact on the minds of the British people. But it had another impact as well, and it, which was that throughout the period of Margaret Thatcher's premiership, the people who were selected as parliamentary candidates uh, and who became members of parliament tended to be reflecting the views which she put forward. If you put forward, if you were using shorthand a pro-European, you were at a disadvantage 
if you were somebody who was standing up against them, uh, you were at an advantage. So when um, the 1992 election came after her, after her defenestration and when John Major was prime minister, when the 1992 election came, the composition of the party was very different from what it had been 15 years earlier. And, and the, the, the nature of the attitudes to Europe reflected very much those taken up in the budget battle. And of course, the same was true. The same was true of, uh, of, of newspapers. So that was the second point. Now, John Major, I think, made a very serious attempt to put the whole show back on the road. I think that Maastricht was a, a very considerable achievement. You will remember his Heart of Europe speech. But when Thatcher, <coughs> bitter at her rejection, used Europe as a, as a weapon to beat him with, that sort of accentuated the feelings which were already building up in, in the party that true conservatism was on, on the skeptic side. And the passage of the Maastricht Bill um, became one of the great dividing lines. I mean, it became one of the great horror stories of parliamentary battles. And where you stood on Maastricht became an identi a sort of identification um, in later years. And then it was followed by Black Wednesday. And from that moment, I think really the, the heart of the Conservative Party had, had set against, against the European venture. I don't mean by that that it was in favour of leaving. I just mean that it became much more open to the idea of leaving. Vernon Bogdano, a constitutional historian, has talked about the delegitimization of, of Europe within the Conservative Party. Now, whether this could have been changed if Ken Clark had been elected as leader of the party is one of the great unanswered questions. He is a very strong man. He is a man of very considerable principle. But whether he would have been able to unite the party on a different strand, on a different direction, or whether he would have split the party it, it is something to which I, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, he was not elected leader. We had first, um, uh, uh, we had William Hague, we had Ian Duncan Smith, and we had Michael Howard. And during those years of opposition, the party fed all the anti-European prejudices and it prepared the way for, U for UKIP. And moreover, another problem arose, which was the whole idea of the referendum. First, a referendum on the single currency. Well, that didn't happen because we didn't join. Then a referendum promised on the European constitution. That didn't happen. Then a, European, a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. That didn't happen. So by the time, and then a, the promise of both the Conservative and Lib Dem parties of a referendum on transfer of powers. So by the time Cameron became uh, leader, the whole uh, impetus of referenda had built up. And it had also become dangerously caught up with the whole idea of immigration. And so we come to David Cameron's period. And there his great mistake, I think, was that he never, he never confronted the European issue head on from the moment he became leader of the party or even prime minister. He tried to, to, to push it to one side. He left it to UKIP to make the running on the European debate. He left it to UKIP to set the, the terms of the agenda. So that when at the time when he made the Bloomberg speech and came out strongly in favor of Europe, he was not a credible, uh, not a credible um, advocate. Kate Ford, <coughs> in her excellent little book on the, on, on the camera here, says, we never rolled the pitch for Europe. Uh, and that, I think, is exactly the right way of putting it. UKIP had been left free to, to set the agenda. And when, therefore, you had the re referendum and you had conservatives leading on both sides, it was Johnson and Gove who were in line with the way the feelings of the party had developed. And it was Cameron and Osborne who were going against the way the feelings of the party had developed. Another weakness that they had was that unlike Jenkins and Heath, 
in 1975. They concentrated on economic arguments and were unable to raise people's sights to the, to the greater issues. They were unable to put it into a context of British interests and a view of the future. And so we come, unfortunately, to the referendum. So that's the background to what I have tried to do. I have tried to explain how the party that took us in became the party that took us out. In my view, a tragic outcome. Christopher, thank you very much indeed. Can, can I start by sort of taking you back to the, the early years and why we were not present at the foundation of the, of the various iterations of, of, of European cooperation. When we had clearly been a, a mover in the creation of the other post-1945 um, structures to maintain defence and security and an economic order in, in Europe and in the wider world and, and to protect the West. And I, I just wonder if we I could sort of press you to try to sort of tease out a bit more on what you think was explains that attitude, whether you ought take the view that certainly I have sort of pondered on that the contrasting historical experiences of this country during the 1940s, as opposed to what most of Europe went through, meant that we came out with a national mythology, that was embodied in Churchill, that uh, was so different from what the others experienced, which was brought in a failure of national uh, identities and institutions. Well, I think that that is cert certainly one reason. I think, so I won't go any further on that. I think the second was that we didn't take the continent seriously. I mean, the, the idea that France and Germany could possibly be in the same organization um, seemed incredible to, to British politicians. I think there was the sense that they were rather hopeless, uh, that they wouldn't be able to agree. And then there was the fact that we put far too much weight on the American alliance and on the Commonwealth. And the belief that the Commonwealth was going to be a great market and a great enhancer of British power was a delusion. But it was a, a mixture of the point that you raised, David, a belief that the Continentals would never get their act together, a sense that we would always be able to influence the Americans, and a delusion about the Commonwealth. You did, you did also say, Christopher, the, in, in describing those early years, that, that led to the creation of the institutions and, and um, mode of operation <coughs> of the European communities and then the European Union. That did, that, that had that, you used the phrase um, lang language terminology that's alien to, to our way of, of thinking. Yeah. And uh, looking back, is there anything that could reasonably have been done that was attainable during the years of our membership that could have improved matters that, that there and, and, and linked to that? <coughs> Were the other key players in the European Union sufficiently attuned to this friction and, uh, or, or did they basically say, you signed it and that, that's, that, that's your lookout now? What, um, what, 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 what do you have to work within these exist the existing order? I think working within the existing order was a big problem. I mean, I, I quote uh, Sir Con O'Neill, who was the chief British negotiator, saying about the Aki Communitaire that you've got to swallow the lot and swallow it now. And that, that was the price for coming in. And if we'd been in at the beginning, First of all, the common agricultural policy would not have been shaped in the way that it was. And secondly, I think there would have, we would have had a greater influence on the way in which the, the language of the European Union, we would have had a, a greater influence on the way in which it was presented. Also, if we had come in earlier, um, then we would have found that we could have worked much more easily with General de Gaulle. 
I mean, the General de Gaulle's ideas of how Europe should develop and our ideas of how Europe should develop um, were really quite similar. But because we came in late, there was the difficulty that for France, the common agricultural policy was an absolute must, whereas for us, it was a, a big difficulty. But I think had we, had we been more open at the time of Lord Kilmuir, had it been argued that we were joining a political enterprise, had the arguments for, for joining a political enterprise been put, I think that would have made a difference. I mean, all of us must so often have heard, I was in favor of joining a common market. I wasn't in favor of joining a political, uh, political union. And, and I think the failure to be frank about, about the, the, the institution I mean, Andrew Schoenfield wrote a very good book called Journey to an Unknown Destination. And I think if it, only we had been able to convey that sense to the British people. I, I want to, I'm going to open this up in a second, but can I, can I just, just uh, ask you to take your mind back to Bloomberg and the, the years that followed. Um, was there a particular point at which, looking back, you think that um, the die was cast, or could you know, could things have been handled differently um, to have uh, produced you know, what was, after all, a, 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 a fairly close yes. uh, out, a clear outcome, and to, to have turned that and so that so that Remain could have won. Well, when something is as close as the referendum was, then obviously all sorts of things could have made a difference. I mean, if Labour had had a different leader, um, that might, might well have, have made a, a difference. Um, I think I, I, I'd, I'd make two points. I mean, one is that Cameron and Osborne emphasised the economic costs of leaving. But they had been in charge of a government whose watchword had been austerity. And therefore, when you had Osborne talking about how dreadful it would be to leave, and he was only, he wasn't quite as bad as the 350 million on the bus, but I mean, he did, he did, he was fairly, fairly bad. I mean, when you had people whose watchword had been austerity, arguing about how dreadful it would be to leave, I think that was difficult in, in many parts of the, of the country. I think that the idea people had voted Conservative because for a number of reasons, but one was they didn't want Corbyn. And as in local elections and as in other things, this was an opportunity to kick the government. But more important than that, Jenkins and Heath in 1974 had raised people's sights. I mean, they had presented the choice as one in which really important issues of peace and war uh, were at stake. Now, the world was very different in 2016. Peace and war were not the messages people wanted. But there was a failure to present the European Union in the way in which we customarily talk of the special relationship with the United States. A failure to present it as a vision of the future in which we would play a part, a failure to present it as something in which British interests were vitally concerned, and, and, and that it was much more than an economic affair. So I, I think perhaps that might have made a difference, but then there was also immigration, and, and I mean, Tony Blair's decision not to take advantage of the derogation on immigration in 2004 and Cameron's promise that he would reduce immigration to, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, to very low figures, was always a, a, very, a, very great, a very great weakness. And we've seen in France that linking immigration to Europe is a very potent mix. Yes. 